Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the audit committee for Wednesday, January 13th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to the COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Rao. I will start with Ms. Causey. Yes. Ms. Joes. Present. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Rao. Present. Thank you. Ms. Jamison, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Anna. Present. Mr. Saris. Present. Dr. Scribbin. Present. Thank you. Thank you. So our first, we did open rest. Our next item is reports. Our first item is the monthly investigative statistics. And for that, I call on Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And Mr. Corns, if we could please open up to uh, that first page of the investigative statistics. Um, just want to uh, very briefly present uh, what the month of December uh, has looked like for us. And then in addition, uh, talk about where we are uh, in terms of year to date statistics. Um, so on that first slide, uh, we talked about our new cases that came in during the month of December. We did receive five cases. Uh, into our hotline. You can see the, the breakdown, uh, the categorization of, of those cases there. And on to that second chart actually shows where we are um, halfway through the year now, uh, six months in. Uh, we are at 45 cases uh, as of December 31st. You can see the breakdown there, uh, different categorization of, of each of the cases that have come in through our hotline. Uh, I can tell you as of today, we are currently at 50. Uh, so we have received five more uh, so far in the month of January. The third chart uh, on page one, it's our year over year analysis. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last time, uh, but you can see that purple line is FY21. And uh, obviously, um, the, the numbers coming into the hotline have definitely decreased uh, from prior years. You can see that, that it is trending b below both uh, fiscal year 19 and 20. Um, for the month of January, with it being five, it does put us uh, back into somewhere in, in that norm um, area. So we'll have to see if that uh, trend is going to continue uh, or, or if we will can continue to um, stay below where, where we have been in prior years. Going on to the second page, uh, we have three 
more charts. Uh, again, these are talking about the same five uh, cases, the same new cases that have come in. Uh, so for those five that came in uh, for December, we then do a categorization of fraud, waste, abuse, or um, non-fraud, waste, or abuse. And one of the five uh, were considered to be abuse, and uh, the remaining four considered not fraud, waste, or abuse. Take a look at the 45 cases received for the entire fiscal year so far. And here's the breakdown uh, of those. Uh, you can see we have 15 fraud, three waste, six abuse, and then 21 um, are non-fraud, waste, and abuse. And then again, we do the three-year analysis um, of, of those categorizations, uh, and you can see where, where they trend out. Um, and looking at it at this point, it looks like uh, for the most part, uh, the, the main change is between fraud and abuse. It, it just seems that the categorization has, has sl slid between those two. Um, Non-fraud waste and abuse remains fairly consistent. Uh, waste, it's, it's a smaller percentage, uh, still, still below that 10% uh, mark. Um, and so that, that is where we are with the new cases that have come in. Uh, this third page, uh, of the of the charts, I'm going to talk about the cases that we have actually closed, and that top chart uh, cases that we closed during the month of December. So we issued eight reports, uh, closing eight cases. Uh, you can see five of those were substantiated, one was unsubstantiated, uh, and two fall into that management issue not investigated category. Um, take a look at where we are in the fiscal year. Uh, for FY21, that's the second chart, and at this point, as of December 31st, we've closed 37 uh, cases, and you see the breakdown of them here. And the final bottom chart uh, of page three, uh, again, is another year-of-year -year, uh, analysis for the last three fiscal years, uh, kind of projecting where we are, um, and you can see the the breakdowns there with fiscal year 21 being the purple column. And Ms. Rowe, that is uh, our December update for the investigation unit. Thank you. Committee members and Ms. Pesher, are there any questions? No, thank you. I just had one question and possibly you've gone through this before. Um, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So could you please explain um, again, when you have fraud findings, what is the procedures for those fraud findings? Do they get reported out to law enforcement? Is this a law, is, is it a legal definition of fraud or an internal definition of fraud? What's the procedure for that? Uh, Ms. Rowe, this is Andrea Barr. So we do have a process with regard to um, uh, our fraud examinations is what we call them. And depending on the nature of what is found and what is substantiated, if it is criminal in nature, those reports are referred to the um, Baltimore County State's Attorney's Office. And we work very, very closely with the Assistant State's Attorney, Mr. Adam Lippy and um, his detectives. So those types of reports are turned over if they are criminal in nature. Okay. And then I assume if there's employee involvement, does that get taken care of within the HR department in their disciplinary actions? That's correct. If there are any disciplinary actions that need to um, be taken or be made, those decisions are made by the Department of Human Resources. Okay, and then does the Office of Internal Audit follow up on those HR things or do you simply submit them and then your job is done? Well, we've recently um, implemented a process where we're getting information back from the Department of Human Resources that tells us what the disposition was related to the cases that we send to them. So we we have closed that loop, if you will, with respect to um, if there's any personnel action taken at all 
and if so, what it is. So it, it's actually called a, a Department of Human Resources disposition form that we receive. OK, thank you. Ms. Cause, you may have the floor. Good afternoon and thank you. So um, Ms. Barr, the Department of HR disposition report that you just mentioned, is that something that is uh, then going to be shared with the audit committee in uh, an administrative function? I don't think we've ever discussed that that potential or that possibility, um, but I believe that if if we get to that point, the appropriate place to discuss that would be in a closed or administrative function um, part of the meeting. We're still working through that process. If you'll recall, Ms. Causey, this is all uh, related to the distribution of our investigative reports to the board members. So that's all part of that process. And as, you, as you'll recall, um, we just began that process this year. So uh, we're working through the process. We're working through the documentation of the process. And certainly if that's information that the audit committee would like to receive, uh, we will incorporate that into the process. Is that something that should be considered to put in the audit committee charter? I think that's more granular because I do believe that the charters uh, reflect that we do report and offer our reports to the board and, and to the committee. And I think it needs to be at a at a higher level or a broader level, much like a policy. I'm not sure that how granular the um, charter actually needs to be. OK, thank you for that. So in terms of um, your comment that uh, depending on what the audit committee wants to do, would that be something that would be helpful to put in a motion to determine the uh, the uh, consideration of the whole audit committee? I'm just wondering I, what the I, I process would, would be at this point to um, because it, it is uh, it is good that we are um, continuing to improve the standard operating procedures and work on the accountability to understand, um, you know, the value of the work of the Office of Internal Audit and that it is being realized in the school system. Ms. Kazi, I think that this is something that as those reports become available, it would be appropriate through the agenda setting process for the committee to have those things added to the agenda, which is something that is the responsibility of the chair and the vice chair of this committee. If that answers your question. It does. I, um, I just think it's helpful to um, maybe have that discussion or, um, you know, to provide guidance to Ms. Barr and or future well, yeah, committee members. Right. The, uh, but I'll just there are reporting requirements already in the charter and it it does this follow up report from HR does actually it is actually covered in the charter. It just may not be in, in an obvious way because the charter does also allow for the, the investigative reports to the board only come to this committee after all of the appeals processes that could come to us in our quasi-judicial authority have been exhausted. And so those HR reports will not come to us until they come to us with the rest of the investigation report. And then I would imagine, Ms. Barr, wouldn't they be part of that report? Correct. So the, I, I want to clarify that these um, disposition reports that we receive from the Department of Human Resources um, you may not be able to have that information at the same time that we do, because as you know, the if there, if there is a personnel action um, that requires or that requires Baltimore County Public Schools to offer 
uh, the appeals process to the individual. As you know, you, you won't have that information until all the appeals have been exhausted. So to me, it probably would go hand in hand with the reports that we issue um, to the board members, because when you receive those reports, we know that all those appeals have been exa exhausted by the employee. So if that's additional information that you would like to be provided um, uh, with the reports, that would be something that I would have to work out with the Department of, of Human Resources because their disposition sheets that we get initially are, are preliminary, if you will, and um, you know, a disposition may be a recommendation for termination, and we get that today, but we might not know if that goes through for another three months or four months, if that makes sense to you. Yes, thank you for that explanation. Um, but part of the conversation that has been um, ongoing in the audit committee for, I mean, over a year is the uh, process by which either the audit chair um, would be um, informed of those things as they go along in terms of um, governance and oversight that the board is not the last one to know about significant issues that are being processed. Right. So, so I Rossi, would I would caution about I'm sorry, uh, Mr. I would caution about as things go along because we have to be very careful when we're in the investigation process. And as I mentioned, you know, the board is responsible in some instances to hear appeals and have hearings related to um, employees. So we have to be very careful with respect to that. And we really don't discuss investigations when we're in in the process, if if you will. I, I understand that. But the the and and the process whereby the full board gets reports um, after all of appeals are are exhausted or uh, if it's a personnel matter that that is finalized. But we had been talking in the audit committee about uh, one person either designated or the just making it in the charter that the um, audit chair um, would be there. So if she or he needed to recuse themselves, um, then they could. The other, um, the other uh, discussion was if there's audit reports that are going to be utilized in, um, let's say it's a personnel matter or some other matter, that those are part of the record then, so which the board should be considering alongside of hearing examiner, um, or the superintendent's designee report um, so that it really doesn't need to be excluded from everyone in advance of the conclusion of that situation. So Ms. Causey, some of the things that you're addressing are things that would have to be brought up in PRC committee and discussed in PRC committee because right now the way that audit committee is functioning is aligned with our policies. And unless we're going to change some of the board policies to um, bring one board member, whether it's the chair of audit or anyone else in the loop early, um, those are not discussions that pertain to the current agenda item. And those are discussions that the committee has had, but they're not things that the committee has decided. And what you're, what you're talking about is a complicated set of things that would need to be worked out across different committees. And we can discuss that later, um, but we have five minutes left or less than five minutes left on this agenda item. And Mr. Kuhn has a comment. So Mr. Kuhn, you may have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I just want to follow on um, because the, the comments that um, Ms. Causey are making, are, are accurate to action that we were discussing previously. And, and, and the main point is this, that um, Ms. Barr informs the superintendent of information that the chair and that the board are not aware of. 
And the whole point in basically picking someone from the board, whether it's the chair or the chair of the audit committee uh, or, or whoever the designee is, is to make sure that the board at least has some knowledge or uh, you know, has some information that the the uh, superintendent has, because it's an it's an it's out of sync. So, the information that is provided, uh, the whole idea behind it was, so that the board of the entire the board itself would be privy to information, and if there was a an HR action or some kind of um, quasi-judicial activity that occurred that that person could recuse themselves and that's why it wouldn't be provided to the entire board right because yeah. um, then it wouldn't be fair I so understand that but the problem with that is that let's say hypothetically and i'm going to entertain this for exactly 30 seconds and then we have to move on to the next agenda item let's say hypothetically that we did that and there was one person who was privy to everything as it was happening it would be completely useless to the board for that one person to have that information because that one person would not be able to share it with the board, would not be able to act on any information, and would have to recuse themselves for everything. So even if that one person knew, the inability to discuss or act on that knowledge makes it irrelevant or moot that that one person knows. And so again, if we're gonna take that up, the place to take that up is in the PRC committee because that is going to evolve um, a legal analysis of what's permitted and policy changes to the audit committee policy. And until, if it's changed in the policy, then we can amend the charter later. But that conversation of how we're going to do that is something that should be taken up in policy. Um, Ms. Joe, do so you have a question on this agenda item or can we move into the next agenda item? Go ahead and move into the next agenda item. Thank you. Okay, so the next agenda item is unfinished business, which is the audit committee charter. So we have two charters. One is the committee charter and one is the office of internal audit charter. So let's start on the audit committee charter. Um, the, the board is, or the committee has had these charters for some time and I have not gotten any emails about um, amendments or changes to the charter. So I guess let's start with, are there any, um, are there any changes to the charter or questions about the charter? Okay, is there a motion to approve the committee charter and forward it to the full board? Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. I was, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to find the uh, file for the- Oh, I'm sorry, I moved too fast. Latest version. That's okay, yes. Well, I, I wanted to see the segment on the reporting. Okay. Can wait and give you a moment to find that. While Ms. Cosby is looking for that, is there anyone else that has any other questions about the charter? I will so move it for you, Ms. Rowe, Molly, your motion. Okay, let's, um, let's, let's, let's hold that until Ms. Cosby has her um, questions and then Thank you. Um, I'll second it. I'll second the motion. So is there any discussion on the motion to um, approve the committee charter to move to the full board? I so, just have one simple question. Yes, Mr. Keene. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Um, does that mean that we, we um, will just have open discussion and cha possible changes at the board level. We're just moving it for their uh, well, for them to, so, yeah. to take. We're not recommending that they adopt. 
Um, I thought the idea was to to, I think to get the draft should, set and then move it up to them yeah. for for review. And if there are any anything people wanted to change, then then well, have discussions with the we, whole group. Yeah, whether we could move it without a recommendation or we could move it with a recommendation. I don't have a preference either way. Um, and I think that even if we moved it with a recommendation, there are still going to be people who are going to ask questions and want to amend and work on it still. And I think that's okay. If the board as a whole wants to work on this, that's fine. Um, so, um, Ms. Jones, you moved it. Is your motion to move move it to the full board without a recommendation or to move it to the full board with a recommendation? And what is the recommendation? I have no recommendation, so we'll move it to the full board. Okay, so the motion is to move it to the full board without recommendation. Does the second accept? No, I, I would like to move it forward with a recommendation. Um, I have a comment after that. So how do we process okay, so it if then, I? Well, if you if you don't, well, that means you no longer second the motion. Is is there someone else who seconds the motion? To move the to move it. I second the motion to move it okay, forward so without motion, a recommendation. Okay. So the so the motion the motion is to move. Um, Sorry, my elect is broadcasting off in my room. Um, the motion is to move the committee charter to the full board without recommendation. It's seconded. Are there questions or debate on the motion? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do support the work of um, the audit committee and um, the Office of Internal Audit, Ms. Barr and staff uh, in working on this. I do think that given um, the understanding of the reporting uh, a bit better, and I thank Ms. Barr for sharing with us the continued improvements, um, that in the um, meeting where this is discussed to the full board, um, that I, I, I will be is it possible that I could make uh, motions to amend at that time? It is possible, yes. You can also make a motion to amend now. Okay, well, I, I would like to have it uh, more time to be considered and sent ahead of time <clears throat> uh, to Ms. Barr, especially um, forward wording and process and so forth. So I wouldn't wanna do that in this okay. meeting today. Okay, very good, thank you. But Are could I make an a, amendment that the that it is moved forward to the um, first meeting in February? Um, so I actually don't know because that would be considered an agenda setting of the general meeting. And I do not know if the committee has the authority to determine when something we're forwarding to the general meeting appears in the general agenda setting as it is. We have a general setting policy, so I don't believe that amendment would be in order. OK, thank you. Um, are there any other questions pertaining to the motion to forward the charter to the general board without recommendation? Ms. Jameson, can I have a roll call vote on the motion, please? Thank you, Ms. Rao. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Rao? Yes. The okay. motion carries unanimously. Um, Ms. Barr, would you please notify the chair, the vice chair, and the superintendent that this has been moved out of committee and um, notify the committee when it will be placed on the full board's agenda. Yes, I will. Thank you. OK, so the next item is the internal audit charter. Are there any questions or amendments to the internal audit charter? 
Ms. Cosby, is that a question from before? Do you have a question now? That was a question from before, but when appropriate, I would just like to make a comment. Uh, you may do so now. Thank you. So I just want to um, state that in the work of the board uh, in improving governance and oversight um, and accountability that this is important work and I just wanted to appreciate um, Ms. Barr and her team for working on that and uh, to you Ms. Rowe for um, moving this work forward. I think it's very important and I just appreciate everyone's efforts. Thank you, Ms. Cosby. Are there any other uh, comments or amendments to questions on this agenda item? Is there a motion to approve the internal audit charter? So moved, Ms. Um, Causey. To send it to send it to the full board. <laughs> Okay, um, Ms. Kazi, is your motion to send with a recommendation or without? With a recommendation. Okay, and the recommendation is to approve, I assume? Yes. Okay, is there a second to Ms. Kazi's motion to approve the internal audit charter to recommend to the full board to approve? I will second that motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? Yeah, I just have a question. This is Mr. Kuhn. Yes, Mr. Um, is there a reason that we just don't move them both the same way? Why we because would recommend could. this one and not the other one? I don't know. I think it's a, a distinction that isn't because one because one was made with a motion to recommend and one was made without. I do think that there is a substantive difference between the two because the Office of Internal Audit Charter is by and large an internal document that's governing a lot of the work internal to their office that for the most part their office created this charter and it makes sense that they had a lot of input on that and i do believe that there has been less questions and less um interjection from board members on the office of internal audits charter versus the board committee charter because the board committee charter governs what this committee does and how it does and how we relate to the Office of Internal Audit, where the Office of Internal Audit Charter is more of an internal operations document and we need to have it so that it's articulated. But I do think that board members, when it goes to the full board, are less likely to have edits or amendments to the internal charter. They're more likely to have questions and ask for Ms. Barr an explanation. But the other um, the other thing too is simply that this is the motion that was made and this is how the committee process is the will of the committee through motions. And Ms. Cosby made a motion to send it with the recommendation. And I seconded the motion. Okay. Um, I would have also seconded the motion to send the other one with the recommendation to approve. But I, I mean, we could just process it. I, that was it. it. That's fine. Okay. I don't need any more. Answer. Are, there, Thank are you. there any other are there any other questions on the motion? OK, the motion is to forward the Office of Internal Audit um, Charter to the full board with a recommendation to approve. Ms. Jamison, will you take the roll call vote, please? Thank you, Ms. Earl. Mr. Kuhn? Uh, yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Barr, would you please notify the chair, the vice chair, and the superintendent that this item has moved out of committee and uh, notify the committee when it has been put on the uh, general schedule? Yes, uh, I will. General board meeting. And also, would um, I would like to make a motion to the committee that we specifically request with these two agenda items when they appear, that they appear allowing the Office of Internal Audit to present to the full board and to explain the agenda items and to give a presentation on what the Office of Internal Audit does. Is there a second to that motion? Second, Ms. Causey. 
Is there any discussion on that motion? I will speak to the motion. Ms. Barr has requested to be able to present to the full board a number of times so that the full board understands what it is that the Office of Internal Audit does. And this is something that I think is important. And if the full board is gonna be deliberating on two charters, I think it's important that when the charters appear before the full board, that her office has the opportunity to present and explain the charters. Is there any discussion? Ms. Jameson, will you call a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, Thank before we move to the next agenda item, may I um, ask a question related to the motion we just passed? Yes, you may. So um, before the ransomware attack, um, you, as the chair of the audit committee and Ms. Barr were working with um, Ms. Gover and Dr. Williams on setting a time for a separate meeting for the full board with um, Ms. Barr in terms of going over um, the Office of Internal Audit. And I just wondered from Ms. Barr's perspective, is her office sufficiently recovered from the ransom attack to do that? And if so, could um, the recommendation be made to Ms. Gover and Dr. Williams to uh, try and get that scheduled? So, um, Ms. Causey, let me speak to that because I did make every attempt to set up a separate meeting or have um, additional committee meetings. And there was so little interest on the part of the board that it was not possible to set up the meeting or people were not available on the same days. And so the inability, um, Ms. Barr sent out doodle polls, or I'm sorry, not Ms. Barr, Ms. Gover sent out doodle polls. And so there just wasn't that kind of interest of other board members to have a separate meeting. And so given that all board members are allowed to attend any committee meeting they wish, Ms. Pasteur was the person who was most interested in what's going on with the audit committee. And so I reached out to her specifically and invited her to attend our committee meetings and participate in any way that she would like to. And so the reason that I'm recommending that, the, that they be allowed to present to the full board is because we have very important agenda items that are coming up to the full board. And there is just no way that the board can deliberate on these two items without hearing anything from the Office of Internal Audit. So the separate meeting was tried and it, it just didn't work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will move on now to um, the OLA audit update, which is Dr. Scriven and Ms. Barr. Mr. Corns, there's there's no uh, attachment related to that. Um, as you as committee members know, we have included in our internal audit work plan um, a line item called continuous monitoring. As part of that continuous monitoring, we planned to include the uh, review of management's corrective action plan related not only to the Office of Legislative Auditors audit report, but other external agencies when they audit our organization. For example, the UHY audit, we're still continuing to uh, monitor the corrective action plan related to that. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that the committee members know that we have gone through all three Office of Legislative Audit reports. We have developed a uh, chart, if you will, identifying all of the, the findings and recommendations and the corrective actions reported. And we are working with um, uh, Dr. Scriven and, and his group to determine the best way uh, to handle this follow-up 
And of course, with the ransomware attack, that has kind of put a delay on some things. But in, in other cases, we are able to obtain certain information and we are working um, closely with, with the staff to follow up on the management's corrective action plan report. And we've also been asked to look at certain things with more specificity and conduct particular audits related in the payroll area and the procurement areas. Board members, are there any questions related to this? Ms. Causey? Yes, Madam Chair. So, given the ransom attack um, and the fact that there were repeated findings related to IT in the 2020 report um, that were also in the 24, excuse me, 2015 report, um, and then the 2008 report. Um, so has that risen to a higher level of importance given, um, given the ransomware attack? Uh, may I ask clarification, has what risen to a higher level of importance, the, our, our monitoring or? Yes, the addressing of the findings related to IT. Yes, we're, we're, we're currently working on that right now, Ms. Causey. Okay, thank you. Ms. Barr, do you expect that at some point in the future, you will have a substantive document that shows us um, what findings you're tracking and what the corrective actions staff have committed to for those OLA audit findings? Yes. I would I would anticipate that if not the the next committee meeting perhaps the meeting after that so that probably in March. Okay. If, if it can be has, if it can be sooner than that, you know, I I will let you know. Okay. And has the ransomware attack caused any loss of documentation that would impact this, or are you um, able to fully function in this regard? Well, we're still in the process. I think everybody's still in the process of, of recovery, Ms. Rowe, and each day uh, we're getting more information related to our office and getting notified that, that we're getting more of our information back. I'm not sure um, with respect to other areas and, and departments within the organization, uh, the outlook for them. So, Keeping that in mind, we're doing the best that we can right now with the information that we do have. Obviously, that is is providing, I guess, a bit of a delay in, in moving forward with certain things, but there are other things. The things that we can move forward with, we are. And the okay, things that we may have to the things that we may have to wait on and see if we get information, we can do that while we're doing the, the other work, if that makes sense to you. Okay, so basically you're shuffling some of the workflow of the items in the work plan. Um, but do you expect anything in the work plan to be um, significantly impacted such that you're unable to shuffle? And so will these OLA audit corrective actions? I guess I'm trying to figure out, there's a lot of corrective actions that are sort of in the CADA report to the committee. And I want to have um, reasonable expectations of your office. And so I would like you to give me some idea and give the committee some idea as to if you expect delays in doing these things because of the ransomware attack. I say the general answer to that is is yes. But right now I can't. I can't tell you, is it going to be a, a one week delay? Is it going to be a one month delay, a two month delay, a six month delay? I, I can't okay. give you that answer this evening, but I, I will work on that. And I do know that, um, like I said, we have documented everything, all the findings, all of the corrective action uh, remarks that were noted in the OLA audit reports. And we are working with the individual offices um, to follow up. I do know that some corrective action has already taken place and been implemented with respect to some of the some of the findings in the reports. And perhaps that might be better addressed by Dr. Scriven and his staff 
with respect to the progress on their corrective action plan. Yes, Dr. Scriven, would you like to comment to that? Yes, good evening. So what 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 specifically uh Ms. Rowe, are you guys looking for a response on? Are you looking for updates in terms of what corrective action we've actually made to this point? Sure. Mr. Corns, if you want to give an update on the immediate actions that we've taken in response to, our, and we're, we're referencing the most recent Audit, correct? Yes, because I heard yes. mention. Okay. All right. The most recent. Mr. Corns. So, uh, Dr. Scriven, in, in terms of our most recent audit, um, we had uh, provided responses back to the Office of Legislative Audit about um, several of the findings that were corrected prior to the audit. Um, document being uh, released as far as um, external IP addresses that were no longer needed had been uh, removed from our firewall. We had taken uh, steps uh, to correct in those natures. Uh, we have been in process of implementing um, uh, suggestions that were made by the audit at the time of the ransomware attack. Um, I don't know how much detail you'd like me to go into right now, Dr. Scriven. Well, so let I, me ask I, this, Mr. Corns. Is it possible for you to present to the committee with a written report that would itemize these things, and perhaps that would be an easier way to process this request? Ms. Rowe, I, I'm, I, at, with, with, in working in conjunction with Dr. Scriven, I'm happy to do that. Uh, the caution I only put around is with um, addressing a lot of the Office of Legislative Audit. They are also very careful in order to present their findings in a way that are not a um, roadmap to um, bad actors. So I would ask the same. No, um, I understand. Yeah. Any documents, any documents that are shared with the committee that are marked confidential, the committee members are well aware and informed that they are not to share with the public or anyone else. So, um, so if you, present Ms. Barr with a report. She is capable of watermarking um, documents to be given to the board and making sure that they do not have any personnel matters that the board members should not see. What we're really looking at is what are the corrective actions that have been taken to date? So Ms. Ms. Rowe, if you could be so kind uh, to go ahead and formally uh, make a request if you want to make it through Andrea Barr to Dr. Williams of the specific ask. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated, and then we will generate a response. Ms. Barr, do you do you understand what I'm asking for? Yeah, Ms. Rowe, I, this is what I suggest and, and what I offer because okay. we we have already begun to compile the information. We're going through our routine process with respect to monitoring now if and we'll follow up and we'll we'll do our job i guess mm -hmm. my question back to you would be with respect to updates as far as i'm concerned we can give interim updates to the audit committee until we have finalized our report and then naturally of course um, the board will get our report with respect to to the uh, follow up or the monitoring of the Office of Legislative Audit um, findings as we did, for example, with the UHY audit report. If you'll recall, we presented information to the committee uh, with respect to where management was in completing their corrective action plan. My suggestion is to let us do that monitoring let us bring the information together. We'll work with Dr. Scriven and his team. And if you want to, we can we can keep this um, as an ongoing item on the agendas as unfinished business until the time that we finalize our written report um, to the audit committee. Yes, I believe that would be appropriate. So we could we could we can leave um, the OLA audit corrective actions on the agenda 
as a standing item and then whatever information you have at the time at each committee meeting, you can update us as to the evolving situation. Thank you. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Okay. Um, does anyone on the committee object to that? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Um, I appreciate Ms. Barr and Dr. Scrivens um, having that conversation. I would just uh, suggest that given the uh, emergent and systemic nature of the ransom attack and the um, corrective action plans related to it in the Office of Legislative Audit, that those interim reports would be made available to the full board and um, perhaps uh, once a month so that it's in line with the with the audit meetings. Um, and if there is something that is confidential, um, it could be discussed in the administrative function of the audit committee. Well, the full board does have access to all of the audit committee meetings, but if the committee wants to at some point move that a specific report be given to the full board, we can definitely do that. Mr. Kuhn, you have a comment? Yes, I just I wanted to mention to everybody that I've I've been requesting, uh, you know, at the end of our regular meetings um, that we have a presentation of the findings of the um, Office of Legislative Audits, actual audit to the full board. Uh, so my expectation is uh, that at some point Ms. Scott is going to add that um, and that all of the board members will be made aware of what the findings are. And I would expect uh, Dr. Scriven and perhaps um, Ms. Barr, you all might, you, I mean, you'd be given the presentation or be involved in it uh, at, at some level. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there because I've been asking for that and I expect to see it at some, some point in the near future. Yes, and certainly if it appears on the general, um, for general meeting agenda, um, I would think the full board would be interested in that. And, but up until that point, we can have this standing item on the uh, committee agenda. And if Ms. Barr would like to present um, at the next committee meeting in that standing agenda item, um, an overview of the OLA audit findings, I think that would be appropriate. Yes, we can certainly re report on our progress that we've made through the month related to this agenda topic. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Um, I believe due to the time, we need to move on to the next agenda item, which is the board expenditure review, Ms. Barr. Yes, thank you. I believe this this um, agenda item was added because uh, the report was discussed with the board and I believe some committee members still had unanswered questions related to the board expenditure review report. So we've added this topic um, for committee members, board members to ask any questions that they have. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Are there any committee members who have questions? Mr. Q. I I do. I I ran out. We ran out of time as we were discussing it um, previously, and unfortunately, I'm not sure if it's available online. Is there a way for us to pull it up very quickly? I believe it was emailed to everyone. And so, Mr. Corns, I believe it it is. Um, there is a link there, Mr. Corns. If you could go back to the. There you go. Board of Education oh, I, Audit Report. I, my apologies, Ms. Board. Which link do you need? Uh, Board of Education Audit Report. I believe that's it. That's it. Doesn't look pretty, but that's it. Okay. I've I found it. I'm I'm pulling it up myself. Thank you. Also, I would just like to remind committee members that if committee members or anyone on the board has questions that they would like 
um, me to facilitate as the chair of this committee. All you have to do is email them to me. I facilitate all questions. Okay, so thank you. You can ask your question here too. That wasn't meant to silence you. Yeah. Sorry. No, I, I just had some basic questions because I want to make sure our, our language and, and I think it is clear, but um, there's, and I'm, and I do apologize. A significant amount of time is, is has gone by since we we had this discussion. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe there was a finding that talked about a purchase requisition um, is required prior to the initiation of a purchase of a good or a service. And my question to Ms. Barr, just so that I'm clear, um, because um, I know we're all, you know, very interested in, uh, you know, following the law regarding procurement and um, contracts. And my question regarding this has to do with the fact that, you know, do did we have, or did we have a question um, uh, contracts in place? Um, with a vendor or a service provider uh, before, um, you know, in a timely manner, I guess is my point. We basically, we had a contract and what this is, is talking about is, did we actually have, I guess the next step is some kind of a requisition um, prior to obligating or spending money on a contract. Do you see my does that does that make sense? I'm sorry that if this is a little jumbled, but I'm 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 trying to clarify this from my understanding. Right. And I, I I'm trying to um understand the question as well, uh, Mr. Kuhn. So what happened was that in some instances services uh, were provided but we did not have the proper purchase order or purchase requisition. The, the process just wasn't followed. And so what happened was that created a liability because we owed those folks money and um, there, there was um, no obligation um, set up, if you will. So, okay, so all right, that clarifies things. So my question is, did we have a contract for those services? Well, we were looking for a, a purchase order. And I understand that. I'm, I'm trying to understand the big picture, right? That whether we we had a contract with the vendor for those specific services versus is, and I, I understand the difference, right? You're saying right, that, right, right, right. So I, I just want to make sure that we're clear because yeah. based on the language, you know, it sounds like, well, there's no way we could possibly purchase this, but a reasonable person would say, well, you have a contract with this provider that allows for X amount of spending. Do you can understand? I, can I interject? This is Debbie Stevens. Yes. Oh, yes. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, if you look at Exhibit A in, in the report, um, it's the, towards the end. Reports, if you could scroll down in the report, that's what I was going to ask because I'm trying to... There are two different examples, Mr. Kuhn, and you're, and you're hitting on, on on two different examples. So I think if, if Mr. Corns, if you could scroll down to Exhibit A in the report, please. Okay, so okay. were you going to, ex I, yeah. I see it, right? Yeah, it's not moving. Um, no, I, I'm looking at it on my own. <laughs> oh, I found oh, the document, oh, okay. so I'm I'm up to what you're, 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 you said it's Exhibit A. So it talks about a purchase requisition for Carney, Callahan, Presser, Bennett, and Shear. Um, so what this says is that services were provided prior to purchase order approval. Correct. Correct. And and again, um, so we had services being provided. The legal service in January, the legal services agreement wasn't um, 
signed until February. Um, and then the um, purchase order wasn't processed until April. So we had already incurred a significant um, amount of expense uh, prior to the purchase order being approved and also before the legal services agreement was was made. Okay, so that's the key, the legal that I'm, I'm right. trying to fully understand. So when you say the legal services agreement, that basically means a contract, right? Correct. Okay. All right, because I've, I've, that is the key piece for me and for the understanding that I was trying to get to. Yes. Does that, does that make sense? Because a purchase order, I understand approval of a purchase order and what have you. Um, but I, I find the more relevant and the bigger important piece is the fact that we have an agreement, which in essence is a contract for a specific amount of money in general that we're expecting to spend or as a board have approved the spending of. Ms. Barr, perhaps at this point it would be helpful if you could go through from the point that the board approves services, as we did in this case, what is expected to happen um, next in the procurement process? Because from the standpoint of the board, we take action when we vote to um, enter an agree into an agreement with um, the vendor and then it moves on to the procurement and purchasing department who then collaborate with the superintendent staff and I guess the real question here is what broke down and what is the corrective action that's going to keep that from happening again? So I'm not sure where the breakdown or failure occurred um, in this particular instance, but the bottom line is, is that you shouldn't be spending money until you have the purchase order in place or, or the agreement in place and then the purchase order. Um, and that's what happened. We were creating a liability because we had these services being provided to us before anything was approved, before a purchase order was approved, before the legal services agreement was approved. So you just can't spend before you do that. Okay, so. Okay, that's yeah, that's that clear. Really I think my, I understand we can't spend before we do that. I'm just not. It's unclear to me what the corrective action is. Miss Barr, uh, yes, Miss Miss Rowe, just for just for understanding purpose, the expectation that the school system has and that you know any good auditor would have is one, you have an agreement which is a contract mm -hmm. that outlines the terms and the amounts associated with those terms. Correct. And then you talk about the mechanics of how purchasing works within the organization. And that's where you get into purchase orders, correct? You're correct, Mr. Kuhn. And then the, and the expectation is for you to be able to track the financials of this organization to say there is a purchase order created for $50,000 and then invoices totaling X amount of dollars came in on these dates and they went out on those dates and it all adds up and we're all happy at that point. Correct. Okay. So all right, good. Board as a, Thank you. Does, does the board as an office, because you know we have a budget we have, does the board as an office have standard operating procedures in order to make sure that we're working with procurement in a way that causes all of these protocols to be followed? Well, the, the, the procedures are in place. They, they are board policy with respect um, to procurement and then of course each individual then you have the superintendent rules which there's a superintendent rule related to um, procurement and then the office of purchasing has their rules um, related to pro procurement okay so is there any action that the office of internal audit is recommending to the board as far as changing our policies or rules so that these things don't happen or is it just a case of individuals following the policies and rules that currently exist? It's the latter. I think it's a matter of 
of education. Mr. Corns, if you could scroll up to the recommendation, I believe it's result number six. Um, so ed, it's a matter of education of the board members, them knowing what the expectations are with respect to, um, and, and you can see that if you scroll a little bit down further, um, Mr. Corns, thank you. You'll see the, the recommendations that we offered and the board's responses. So um, it's a matter again of education of board members knowing what their responsibilities are of knowing what the rules are with respect to procurement and then simply following those rules. Now, obviously there are times when emergencies occur, things happen and things like that should should be documented. And in some instances, sometimes, you know, if documentation isn't there, the, the emergency is not documented, things of that nature. But for the purchases that were made by the board, these were not emergency type of things that with proper planning, perhaps, um, timeline set out, established things of that nature, we may not have found ourselves in this particular situation. Okay, so it's, it's process. It, it would be a matter of education and then developing the, the process that would allow you all to be compliant. So, okay, so basically professional development for board staff because individual board members don't actually process any of this is my understanding. Correct. Okay, so Ms. Causey, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Barr, for um, all of that commentary. <clears throat> Um, as we were scrolling through the document, I just wanted to point out that um, the approval by the board um, occurred on January 22nd, 2019, which was approximately seven weeks after the entire board was um, seated in December, uh, December 3rd, and then um, eight, eight out of uh, 12 board members were brand new. Um, and then the next thing, as Ms. Rowe pointed out, there's uh, staff that's involved in the processing and that the request for uh, a purchase order was not prepared until March 22nd. So there were two months that went by uh, with uh, staff not preparing that requisition. So that as, as Ms. Rowe pointed out, um, the board and board members and the board chair do not do the work of preparing, signing and remitting requisition orders to purchasing and the board uh, members or the board chair are not involved in uh, the length of time that it takes purchasing to uh, approve the requisition and then issue the purchase order. So all of those pieces were going to be included in the standard operating procedure manual, which I think may have been um, delayed. The goal was uh, December, but because of the ransom attack, I believe that uh, that goal is delayed. Um, and um, then there would be professional development uh, developed and then provided to board members and then as also as part of uh, board member training and board chair training, uh, board chair orientation. So there are a lot of moving parts and with an organization as large as ours um, and that does have transition and leadership positions uh, that those standard operating procedures are going to be very helpful in the past, uh, very helpful in the future. Um, Ms. Barr, I did have a question because this particular issue um, spoke to a $1,000 um, limit and is that for, for in our procurement policies and maybe Dr. Scrivens can speak to this and the rules and the procedures is the thousand dollars for every type of um, purchase is it materials and services I just wanted a clarification on where was the thousand dollar limit where does that apply it's a thousand dollar limit her. Now, I, I would need clarity because I'm on via phone around services. Um, and Mr. Saris, if you're on, you may want to interject. Um, 
because I'm not sure what type of services you're referencing. So this was services, uh, legal services for the superintendent search back in January of 2019 when the uh, board was um, a couple weeks into our service. Okay, so this All is right. George Sarah and um, we did uh, do an RFP and strike a contract agreement with that search firm. And are we now speaking about a payment against that contract? Mr. Saris, in addition to the search firm, there was a separate engagement with legal services. Yes, I, uh, I found out about that later and I don't believe that it it went through customary channels. Um, and so I really uh, can't comment on it because uh, I'm not sure that my staff uh, was aware of that engagement. Thank you. And I'm not sure at what point your staff was engaged. As I said, the board had an approval in January and that was guided by the board council in terms of the process and then it was uh, not until March the end of March that a purchase requisition was submitted to your office and so I don't know what the delay was uh, on the administrative side of that um, but as Ms. Barr pointed out uh, it's it became known and they should have standard operating procedures um, manual in place to to identify that. Miss Causey, if I may. But my, but my question to per, around the procurement was, Causey, is the thousand dollar limit related to services or is it materials or is it everything? Yes, so if, if we look on page five of the report, the current school system guidance, Office of Purchasing Procedure number 3210.013, indicates to initiate the purchasing process, a requisition order is processed upon approval of the requisition order, a purchase order is created. Upon obtaining the approved purchase order, the purchase of a good or service can be initiated. So it, it applies to a good or service, materials, anything that's purchased. Um, if that was your question with respect to the thousand dollars. So the requisition pr procedures for purchases over a thousand dollars weren't followed for the legal services. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, and, and also for um, conference attendance by um, certain board members. Yes, so, uh, so again, the first step is the approval by the appropriate manager, account manager, and um, in terms of a contract for a service, the Board of Education is the uh, is the account manager. Well, but the Board of Education designates the board board chair as the account manager. So, um, but that, and again, as I explained to the board, this audit was done as a matter to educate the board to let them know um, where they need specific training to make sure that that they are following the rules, that they are compliant. Um, and I believe that the board response uh, addressed all of our recommendations. We will be conducting a follow up as we do with, with all of our audits that have any findings to ensure that the corrective action that was stated in the board's response has been implemented. Um, and as I stated earlier, I think a, a large part of it has to do with education of board members. I do believe um, that the staff knows what they are supposed to do with respect to the processing of purchase orders. Sometimes there are delays. Sometimes because of those delays, the process is, aren't followed and overrides have to be done. And I do know that um, some overrides had to be made um, at the budget level that's not typically done. So these are all things that we just want to make sure don't happen again, that the board understands 
what their responsibilities are with with respect to managing their own budget, basically. And um, like I said, I, th I, I do believe that the board's response addresses our recommendations and and if they are able to implement their corrective action, I don't anticipate there being any types of these findings of these nature in the future. Yes, Ms. Barr, I agree with that. And um, uh, it was helpful to work on this report with you, but the the procedures that you quoted, those aren't just for the board, that's for the school system as a whole. So offices, schoolhouses, uh, central office, is that correct? That's correct, but we also went to the state finance and, and uh, procurement article and the annotated code, and um, and also we noted that um, some of these instances related to procurement of the board were also included in the Office of Legislative Audit report about the about the need to bid for services, and that was included in the Office of Leg Legislative Audit FY15 report. So it's not that we we went beyond um, the Board of Education policies and rules to make sure that we were compliant with state law and procedures as well. So um, we specifically made mention and note of the, the state finance and procurement article that we used as criteria. Um, okay. Yes, thank uh, you. Committee, committee members, uh, in the interest of time, and we have another agenda item, um, if there are no objections, I would like to move board expenditure review to unfinished business to be continued at the next audit committee meeting. Are there any objections to that? Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with any questions or comments I would have regarding it. I don't. I, I don't have no further are there questions. Any, are there Thank any you. committee members? OK, if there are no committee members who have further questions on that, then uh, we will complete that agenda item and it will not need to move to the uh, to the next meeting. And so we will move on to the next agenda item, which is administrative function. May I have a motion to go into administrative function to discuss investigative reports? So moved, Causey. May I have Se a second? Second, Ken. May I have a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Ms. Rao. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joes? Ms. Joes? Ms. Rao? Yes. Thank you, that's three in favor. Okay, uh, Mr. Corns, would you please tell me when the live stream is ended? And Ms. Barr, can you advise on 